Okay, so this week our activity for Bio 100 is going to be the nutrition lab. And uh, your job ahead of time, you need to do this. You need to, to keep uh, a 24 hour, hour record of all food, beverages, dietary supplements that you consume. Uh, precision is very important here. It's important that you uh, note that there's a difference between eating two bowls of cornflakes and two cornflakes. Uh, this is the kind of thing that can dramatically impact the results that you get in your output. Uh, you're going to take this 24-hour log of everything that you eat and uh, take it to the library, enter your data into the dietary analysis program, get a printout of the analysis, and bring that printout to the lab with you. It's going to be several pages. Don't just print the summary because we need to have all of the uh, micronutrients included. That's going to be part of our, uh, of our work. Okay. Um, the other thing you need to do is to keep a 24-hour log of all activity, uh, all uh, physical activity, mental activity, whatever you're doing for a 24-hour period, uh, write it down. Uh, and precision is important. to Keep track of how many minutes uh, you spend or, or what fraction of an hour you spend in each activity. And you'll be recording that data, uh, th those data, onto the table in our lab book and bring that to lab with you, of course. Okay, and these are things you have to get done ahead of time. You're not going to be able to do them. I suppose you could just try to fill something out, fake it just before laboratory, but it's not going to give you a very good record, and you're not going to be able to benefit from the exercise. Okay, so if we start with the diet analysis, uh, there are going to be three uh, main components of your diet, which are going to be the macronutrients. These are the basic molecules that are going to be composing the uh, nutritional component of the things that you eat. And they are carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. And this should sound really familiar to you, kind of bringing back fond memories of Unit 3 or Module 3 when we talked about the macromolecules. Uh, you might note that nucleic acids are not there because basically the DNA and RNA represent a really small proportion of the cells. Although you have to realize that if you're taking in carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, you're probably taking in cellular material, which, which means that you'll be taking in DNA and RNA as well, and you'll be breaking those down. Okay. Another thing that's missing here is water. Water is, is, isn't a nutrient. There's no, uh, there's no nutritional value in water, although it's absolutely, absolutely essential to have it. It's, it's like, it's like the, the, main, the main bulk of all the mass of the food that we eat, and without water, you, you wouldn't be able to take up any of the nutrients. Also, another thing that comes up is the uh, the question of alcohol. Is alcohol a nutrient? Well, it certainly provides a lot of calories, but there's no nutritional value. It doesn't provide any um, monosaccharides or amino acids or fatty acids. Basically, has no real nutritional value. Uh, you could argue that wine, uh, or red wine, might provide some protection that might be good for you in some various ways, but it's not the alcohol. That is the, uh, uh, the the good part of red wine if you're into that sort of thing. Okay, so apart from the macronutrients, we also have these uh, things we call essential nutrients, which actually overlaps with the macronutrients. For example, we know that proteins get broken down into amino acids, and there are nine essential amino acids. Uh, yeah, they're fats. Fats are largely composed of things like phospholipids and triglycerides. Normally we call the, uh, the, the fats, like, uh, like vegetable oils and animal oils, those are mostly triglycerides. <clears throat> and in those there are a couple of uh, fatty acids that are absolutely essential, alpha-linoleic acid and regular lin linoleic acid. Uh, you might have heard of, of omega-6 fatty acids, that's the uh, linoleic acid and the Omega-3 amino acids, uh, sorry, omega-3 th omega fatty acids, and that's uh, the alpha linoleic. So there are also two essential fatty acids that are there in the food that we eat. Uh, by essential, what we mean is that we can't synthesize them. Okay, uh, we can't make them from scratch. If we don't eat those amino acids, if we don't consume proteins that contain those amino acids, then we're going to be nutritionally deficient. If we don't eat um, natural fats that contain those two essential fatty acids, then we're going to be nutritionally deficient or malnourished. And we'll be seeing the consequences of malnourishment or malnutrition. 
Okay, so when it comes to essential nutrients, uh, as we've already talked about, there are nine essential amino acids, as well as two essential fatty acids. Now it's worthwhile to note here that there are no essential carbohydrates, uh, even though carbohydrates typically represent the majority of our caloric intake. There are no carbohydrates that are absolutely needed for good health that we cannot make from scratch. Uh, a good example would be glucose. I mean, obviously a lot of our cells are using glucose. We talked about glucose in uh, module five when it came to the uh, understanding of aerobic and anaerobic metabolisms. So obviously glucose is a very important molecule for us to consume as food. Uh, and yet we don't need to have glucose in our diets because we can actually manufacture glucose for those cells like our brains that absolutely require glucose to be there. Okay. Now, in addition to these essential nutrients that are part of the major macronutrients, we can also identify some micronutrients, and these are primarily the vitamins and the minerals. Okay, now the difference between vitamins and minerals is that vitamins are organic, uh, meaning that they're based in some type of carbon-based structure. Uh, remember we talked about organic molecules as those having some carbon and usually hydrogen. And, and, th and, and vitamins are uh, kind of complex molecules involving hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, sometimes nitrogen. And these are usually cofactors uh, required for enzymes to do their work. Um, you know, so for example, you, you know that uh, an enzyme is a catalyst that facilitates a particular type of enzymatic reaction. We talked about salivary amylase that was important for breaking starch into uh, monosaccharides and disaccharides. Well, there's some enzymes that require an extra little piece to come in and provide uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the key that unlocks the ability of the enzymes to do their work. And that's where, uh, that's where vitamins come in. Um, you know about things like vitamins, vitamin A, several ver versions of vitamin B, vitamin C, etc. Okay. Now minerals are inorganic, meaning that they're not part of a carbon-based structure. They're not part of a big molecule. Like a, like a vitamin is usually a molecule that consists of carbon and hydrogen and oxygen and nitrogen, whereas minerals are just pretty much the element. Uh, yeah, they're, they're complex with organic things sometimes, but it's really what we care about is the actual element. Okay. Now there's some elements we don't count here. For example, carbon, C, hydrogen, O, oxygen, or sorry, C, carbon, hydrogen, H, oxygen, O, nitrogen, N, sulfur, S. Those are all things that will come in the form of amino acids and carbohydrates and fatty acids. Our macronutrients will provide all the carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur that we need. And you could also add to that the phosphorus that we get from the nucleic acids. Remember, nucleic acids are going to be there it was DNA and RNA anytime that we're eating uh, stuff that comes from living organisms. Okay. Now when we talk about minerals we're talking about other uh, elements that are there in the periodic table that are required that are none of the above. Uh, a good example would be sodium and A and potassium. We talked about those in the context of the sodium potassium pumps that are required to move stuff across membranes. Uh, calcium Ions, I think we'll be talking about those later on. Chloride ions are there. For example, if you, uh, anytime you eat any salt material, you're taking in both sodium ions and chloride ions. And these are basically involved in the general traffic of ions throughout cells. Okay, so the ionic forms of these, uh, of these elements are going to be important for general physiological function. Okay. And there are a whole bunch of other, I mean, just a huge number of other minor micronutrient minerals uh, that are required as parts of, uh, of functional proteins. A, a really good example of this would be iron, Fe. And, and you know that if you lack iron, you're going to be anemic. And that's because iron is the important part in hemoglobin, which helps you carry oxygen in your blood. And without good hemoglobin, you're not able to transport oxygen to all of your tissues. And you can't do that without iron. Uh, zinc, Zn, is another, uh, is another one of these minor micronutrient minerals. But, and, and this list actually is quite long. You'll be seeing quite a few of them in the output from your dietary analysis. 
And so at this point, you know that the macronutrients, uh, in particular the proteins and the fats, are important because they provide us with the essential amino acids and the essential fatty acids. But that's not really accurate. It's not the main reason why we eat, the, ma the main reason why uh, we consume these macronutrients. The main thing that we get from macronutrients is calories. And let's start by reminding ourselves of just what a calorie is. Uh, in the very first lab of the semester, we learned that a calorie is a measure of energy. And in particular, a calorie was the amount of energy required to increase the temperature of water by one degree Celsius. And a kilocalorie, which is basically the same as a calorie that we normally talk about, the caloric content of food, is the energy required to increase the temperature of one kilogram of water or one liter of water by one degree Celsius. Okay, uh, so yeah, a, a calorie is actually a measure of energy. Now the question, why do we need calories? What's a, what does a calorie do for us? Okay, now I hope you got that one correct because it should have been really, really easy uh, because we spent a lot of time talking about this in Module 5. Obviously, we need the calories in order to drive the fueling reactions of metabolism. Glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, it all starts off with a molecule of glucose. And what the glucose is providing is the oxidation potential, the calories, the energy uh, that we're using in order to drive the synthesis of ATP from ADP plus phosphate. Okay? Now you expend energy just being alive. We're going to call it basal metabolism. We'll talk about it a little bit further later on. In all activities that you do, besides simply being alive, which includes everything from uh, from writing notes, from sleeping, to texting, to uh, running marathons. All activities uh, are going to add to your metabolic expenditure, your caloric expenditure. And when you put it all together, we have to we have to replace all that ATP. We have to uh, all that ATP that's being consumed by all that activity, including being alive, is going to have to be replaced. And that's where we uh, bring food in. Here's another question. What would happen to you if you didn't eat for a whole day? Now, obviously, I, I hope, obviously, the answer is, is not that you'll die. Okay, why don't you die? I've, you know, we're, we're going to need to have calories. We're going to be expending lots of calories on that day that you don't eat. And if you don't consume any calories, then basically you'll be at a calorie deficit. But we have stores of energy, uh, fat stores, uh, glycogen stores, but largely the fat stores is what we would be looking, we'd be tapping into during that day. And you'd be mobilizing some of those calories that, you're, that you have in your fat tissue and you'll be consuming those kind of to replace the calories that you're not eating as uh, for as long as you're not eating. Now there's some animals that can't eat f for a whole day without starving to death. I mean if you're uh, a small and as uh, metabolically active as say a hummingbird, if you were to maintain that full level of activity that hummingbirds expend uh, without eating, without actually putting calories back in, you would die. You would starve to death. Okay? Uh, but that's not the case for really big animals like us. Um, obviously, we're not going to be undernourished unless we are actually going to be not consuming enough calories for a long, long period of time. So if you're chronically uh, undernourished, then that would have really serious repercussions. And that's what we're getting to next. Okay, we're going to start on the Wikipedia page on malnutrition. And what we'll see here is that it's a really long page, okay? And this is actually a pretty good place to start. Uh, look through this on your own and, and find out some interesting facts about some of the things that are on the table for today's discussion. Okay, it's actually a kind of a global issue, right? Uh, globally, we have a significant fraction of the world's human population that really does not have access to adequate nutrition. Um, chronic insufficiencies in uh, caloric intake will result in things like weight loss, 
decreased productivity, vulnerability to disease, low birth weight, uh, nursing mothers might not produce enough milk, and between low birth weight, not enough milk, uh, poor defenses, poor immune defenses, we're dealing with some really serious health consequences. And it's actually absolutely true that a, a, maybe even the uh, the largest cause of human mortality worldwide is some way is in some way related to poor nutrition. Um, here in the United States, it's a slightly different problem. Uh, we have abundant access to high caloric foods, and uh, to go with the human tendency to have a great appreciation for high calorie foods. I mean, if you think back in time to when you were just a foraging animal, um, if you were uh, very uh, obsessed with eating foods that had a high caloric content, you'd actually have a significant advantage. You, you, you'd be more likely to uh, to have enough calories to raise a brood of offspring uh, compared to another animal that's more or less equivalent that only liked to eat sawdust. Yeah, you see, so I mean, if, if you get lots of calories, you get lots of nutrition, another animal doesn't uh, is, is not as obsessed with getting good caloric intake, uh, you're definitely going to have an advantage. So the, these preferences for high caloric foods has probably been reinforced over a very long evolutionary history for humans. Okay. Uh, now we fast forward to the modern world where we have abundant access to very high calorie foods and combine that with this innate uh, appreciation for, for rich foods and you get a formula that leads to kind of like a worldwide epidemic of of uh, overnutrition and obesity. Okay? Um, note that it's actually possible for somebody to be uh, malnourished, in other words, having an inadequate consumption of certain uh, nutrients, and still be overnourished. You can ha you can be taking in tons and tons of calories, but not enough of a particular nutrient, which would give you some sort of malnourishment overnourishment combination. And this brings us to our diet analysis. Now, I'll, I'll lay this on you. There are really two problems that are associated with diet analysis uh, in this laboratory. Uh, one, I might have mentioned this before, is that we have inaccurate reporting. Students will mostly underreport their caloric intake. This is an observation that I've seen many times. Uh, there's always somebody that overreports, uh, or either that, or they're uh, maybe they're athletic, or or they're training for a marathon. So if you're running, uh, if you're running, you know, 20 kilometers in the morning and 30 kilometers in the evening, uh, yeah, your your caloric intake just to maintain a status quo is going to have to be be uh, be phenomenally high. Uh, but for most people with normal activity uh, levels, the typical pattern is for students to underreport. Uh, I'm not going to be too worried about that, uh, provided that your report is somewhat accurate. Uh, if, if you're coming in with such inaccurate reporting that uh, your caloric intake is like 15% of what it should be, I'll probably just send you back to the library and have you uh, do another report. Okay. Uh, the, other, uh, the other issue that comes about with these uh, student exercises for 24 hours is that the 24 hours that you report on is not necessarily going to be a good representation of what your overall diet is. Uh, if you are deficient for one particular vitamin on a given day because you happen not to eat any of those foods rich in that vitamin, then you might find from this analysis that it, sh it, it'll, it might tell you that you're deficient for that vitamin when the reality is that you don't have to worry about it because on a long-term basis you actually get quite enough of it. Okay, uh, this is just kind of like par for the course for this exercise. Uh, we're going to be working on our diet analysis reports as though the reporting is accurate and as though it's actually pretty representative for what uh, you normally consume. Okay, now what I'm going to ask you to do is to uh, use the results and identify three potential deficiencies of specific nutrients. Um, you identify three things for which you're under 100%. And uh, Google up what they are, what those nutrients are, and what the health consequences might be for uh, an inadequate intake of those nutrients on the long term. Okay? Uh, and uh, in addition to that, identify some foods that you might start eating that would help 
if it turns out that you're uh, deficient for that you know you, for example you, know, you might find that uh, folic acid uh, you might find that folic acid is there at 75 percent of the recommended daily intake okay so what you're going to do is you'll uh, google folic acid you might go to wikipedia find out what wikipedia says about folic acid i think i actually have a page here uh, let's see if i can find it Uh, so folate is another word for folic acid and insufficient intake of folic acid is going to you know you can read here that folate is involved in adenosine guanine and thymidine synthesis so you might say well if you don't have enough folate you're not going to be take you're not going to be able to synthesize your uh, your dna your nucleotides well enough and that's absolutely true so so you can uh, read further you could say well signs and symptoms of folic acid um, uh, deficiencies the causes are obviously going to be not taking in enough of the folate and uh, you can you can do you can prevent this by taking in uh, enough foods with adequate folate and that would be like uh, leafy green vegetables so eat your kale everybody uh, you could also uh, supplement your diet with uh, with a B vitamin supplement and that would have the effect of filling whatever gap you have in your vitamin B12 uh, and, so, and folate intake okay so that's kind of like your that's going to be part of your exercise your in-class exercise and you can prepare for that ahead of time okay and this brings us to the activity analysis which we're going to be doing in two different ways okay uh, the first one obviously is going to be your log you have recorded all of your activities for 24 hours detailed to the minute in terms of everything that you've done you're counting for a full 24 hours you're going to be running through the calculation of your basal metabolic rate based on your body size and you're going to be uh, using a little multiplying factor and uh, and estimating your caloric expenditure rate for the different uh, number of minutes that we have in the 24-hour period uh, at the very bottom of the table you're going to come up with the number of kilocalories that you have consumed or you've expended over that 24-hour period now, now the computer uh, the computer output is going to give you pretty much the same estimate the number of calories that it thinks that you consumed over that period and its approach is kind of different it's not going to be detailed for activities you're just going to be putting in uh, whether you think you're sedentary lightly active more active super active or whatever the terms are that you will be putting in it, it will be more detailed it's going to ask you for information about your demographics and this is actually kind of neat because um, your basal metabolic rate the baseline upon which you're adding additional activities is not something that's only determined by body size that's you know, that's kind of like our approach uh, BMR is also influenced by your age uh, your gender your general state of health uh, for example if you're pregnant you will be consuming more calories than you would if you were not pregnant pregnant if, if you were suffering from pneumonia you would be consuming more calories than you would be if you were not suffering from pneumonia yeah, pregnancy and pneumonia are kind of the same thing in that regard uh, and, and so uh, and so the computer method is is kind of more detailed when it comes to demographic information the uh, uh, log of activity method is uh, more detailed in terms of the actual activity record you know I, I guess the point of interest here is sort of like which one is better no we're not going to be able to evaluate that but uh, the uh, the two different methods might give you dramatically different estimates or they might give you estimates that are about the same now that's pretty much it now, overall pretty much this entire lab could be done at home or, or on your own time and and all we have to do when we actually get into lab past all of the stuff that we normally do at the beginning uh, is go over the output uh, I'm going to be having you complete a worksheet based on the hard copy printouts you'll be getting based on the uh, on the calculations you make from your activity analysis but apart from that uh, most of what we do in laboratory will be kind of self-guided okay uh, see you guys in the lab uh, have a good week